So kia ora, everyone. Apologies for my voice. Been a long travel to come all the way to your beautiful part of planet Earth. Let me just start by saying what an emotional experience it was to listen to this beautiful poem, Elena. And as a scientist, I must say it's probably the best summary ever done of the book that we wrote a few years back. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, phenomenal, phenomenal. And, uh, and let me pick up exactly where Elna ended. I'm an Earth System scientist. I have the privilege of chairing the Advisor Committee of Future Earth, the world's largest scientific community, really trying to advance our knowledge of how our self-regulating complex Earth system operates, trying to understand the transformation pathways towards a safe operating space to the future. This is the scientific community of thousands of scientists, 70% of what goes into the IPCC all the way to the global governance research. I also have the privilege of chairing something called the Earth League, the 15 frontier research institutions that really, really want to act on the evidence we're sitting on, from Nobel laureate Mario Molina in Mexico, you know, one of the three that identified the depletion of the stratospheric ozone layer that got us to the Montreal Protocol and deviated ourselves back into the safe operating space on not depleting our protective stratospheric ozone layer. This has put me in a position where I can say with some ob objectivity today at the New Frontier gathering right today that there has never been, as a scientist, reason to be more nervous than today. We are standing on so much evidence that we actually, for the first time ever, as scientists, need to pose the following question. Are we, as humanity, at risk of destabilizing the whole Earth system? We've never had to pose that question before. We've never researched that question before, that we, as humanity, could actually destabilize the whole planet. But I can tell you, as a scientist, there's never been more reason to feel schizophrenic, because if there's never been more reason to be nervous, there's never been more reason to be hopeful. It's quite extraordinary. We see so much evidence of a transformative embarkation on a journey that can actually take us back to a safe operating space on Earth. I agree with Matthew. We see the elements of a new renaissance. We see that sustainability is changing face. Many of us was part of the journey when environment and development was born with the Brundtland Commission and the Stockholm Conference in 1972, where it's largely we did everything we could. But what was it about? It was about protecting nature from us bad humans. It was largely about sacrifice. It is largely still about willingness to pay. You go into any store, and if you want to buy ecological, sustainable food, you have to be prepared to pay a premium of 15 to 20 percent more than conventional, unsustainable food or material goods that are actually cheaper, only because they are subsidized by the planet. Now, this is such a mistake, but we're starting to see the shift. We're starting to see a transition where sustainability is the very entry point for success. We're starting to see an entry point in business, in civil society, in policy, recognizing that the next step towards transformation, towards innovation, towards equity, towards social inclusion, towards a transformation to healthier lives is through sustainability. So we are at this verge. I would argue that the New Frontier meeting here in New Zealand 2018 is at exactly the point of transition. Where are we wobbling towards? And I would argue today we are actually rolling in the right direction. It's not a question if we're going to decarbonize the world economy. It's a question, will we do it fast enough? And that is why it's so important to be at this dialogue as we are right now. Now, I would like to share with you just the scientific insights, which I would argue are the three most important insights to bear in mind in these dialogues on solutions. So now I'll just go for a moment into the diagnostics of challenge. The first insight, which I today argue is the most important scientific accomplishment over the past 30 years, is that science can now inform humanity that we have entered a whole new geological epoch. We are now in the Anthropocene. Anthros for us humans. 
we are now the largest force of change on planet Earth. We surpass equations, uh, the earthquakes or positions vis-a-vis -vis the sun or large, large natural variability. We are in the driving seat. We are the determinants of the future of the planet. Now this starts, just like Elena reminded us, with the invention of the coal-fired steam engine in 1750. That's where it all began. But it wasn't until 1955 that we took off in what now is baptized the moment of the Great Acceleration. Ten years after the Second World War, where three billion people, we put in the high gear of what became the globalized industrial metabolism. But you know, Mother Earth, she was so strong. She was so resilient. Unsustainable acceleration of the human enterprise actually worked. No invoices were sent back, just like Ilna points out. And it worked up until the late 1980s, early 1990s, when we started to see the first scientific signs that we have filled up the entire space. We have reached a saturation point. We're starting to hit the hardwired biophysical ceilings of the processes that regulates the state of the Earth system. The rainy systems, the oceans, the sea level rise, the functions that enables us to have economies and human well-being. Now this is, in a way, a very sad moment when I had this grand opportunity this morning to listen to this reconnection to the biosphere from the Maori culture. It's like science and the world has caught up with indigenous cultures like the Maori who have been recognizing this all the time. I mean, you're so far ahead that reconnecting to the biosphere, guardianship of ecosystems, the integrity of the ecology is something that is inside us. We are integral to the Earth system. You talk to a conventional economist, and please don't cite me here, they tend to forget that we live on planet Earth. You know, we disconnected with the Industrial Revolution. The moment we invested in fossil fuel-driven GDP growth, we could also play the game as if humanity was here and the Earth was somewhere else, an externality. We had global commons. Sure, we kind of looked at them with respect, but we didn't really care. And we could load them with greenhouse gases. We could overfish. We could deforest. We could embark on the sixth mass extinction, as Ma Matthew reminded us, an exponential journey that took us to the Anthropocene. Insight one. Insight two, dear friends, is much deeper and much more important. If we are putting so much pressure on the Earth system, the question is, what's the desired state of the planet? Where does she have to be to support us and our prosperous future on planet Earth? Science can answer the question. And the answer is very simple and, for many of us, quite obvious. That if you look at paleoclimatic data from Antarctica, from Arctic, from Greenland, it shows clearly that the last 11,000 years, when we left the last ice age and entered the interglacial phase we learned in school to call the Holocene, this is the only state of the planet that we know for certain that can support humanity. And as Elna pointed out in her beautiful poem, it was then that we domesticated animals and plants. We went from hunters and gatherers, and we became farmers. And this was the starting point of the modern civilizational journey that has taken us to the starting point of the fourth industrial revolution. So the insight is as simple as it is harsh. The Holocene is our desired garden of Eden. This is what we have to be guardians of. That's why it's so dramatic, because we're in the Anthropocene and we're actually pushing ourselves out of the Holocene. Can you imagine? The average mean temperature on Earth during the entire Holocene period wobbles between plus minus one degree. One degree. Where are we now? At 1.1. We are already beyond the Holocene maximum temperature on Earth. This is a very important reminder. Never ever do the mistake to think of two degrees as the Paris Agreement as being kind of a harmonious future for humanity. Oh no. Those low-lying island states, those nations in the world that fought for 1.5, they were based on science. Because even 1.5 is a challenge to adapt to to invest in resilience because it's beyond the Holocene. The third and final insight is if you punch planet Earth, how does she respond? Well, we built our economies, our governance systems, our societies on the assumption that if you punch planet Earth, she just changes incrementally. 
linearly and predictably. That's where discount rates come from. That's where our governance systems come from. That's where our economic assumptions come from. Nothing happens in terms of tipping points or surprise. Science is today clear. It's exactly the reverse. The normality is surprise. Long, 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 long periods of slow change can suddenly shift over when you cross thresholds into abrupt and irreversible change. We have evidence from wetlands to rainforests to oceans to coral reefs to ice sheets. All planet Earth needs to be taken care of with cherishment and guardianship to preserve biodiversity so that we can keep the resilience in the system to avoid tipping points. When you put all these things together, Anthropocene, the Garden of Eden, the Holocene, and tipping points, it leads to the conclusion we need planetary boundaries. We need to ask the question, what are the processes that regulates the state of the Earth system so we can have a desired planet? We have identified them through 30 years of Earth system science. It is the climate system. It's the stratospheric ozone layer. It's stable oceans, the three big ones. But it's also the four slow variables under the hood of the Earth system that really gives us the resilience biodiversity, nitrogen and phosphorus, land systems, and water, the bloodstream of the Earth system. And then there are two more, the two final ones, which is chemical loading, everything from nuclear waste to microplastics and organic pollutants, and aerosol loading, the way we tend to change rainfall systems on Earth through loading our black carbon and particulates. These nine boundaries have been through so much scrutiny now through 10 years of research, and we've come to the point where we're very confident today that if we can be planetary stewards of the nine planetary boundaries, we stand a good chance of a prosperous, socially inclusive future within a safe operating space on Earth. We're even able today scientifically to quantify them, to give you a safe operating space. If we can transition in, we have a nice opportunity to remain in Holocene-like conditions. Now you hear perhaps I say Holocene-like. We will not be able to go back to the Holocene. I'm really sorry. We are beyond it. But Holocene-like means the challenge now is to transform so fast. I mean, within one generation, it's for us now, it's just one generation. We need to decarbonize the world economy. We need to have sustainable, healthy food. We need to safeguard biodiversity. We need to halt all forms of big chemical pollutants in our Earth system so we can have a manageable Earth system for our future into something that we can really take responsibility for future cultures and future generations. That is the planetary boundary framework. Now, the planetary boundary framework has today become, you could say, the new definition of sustainability in the Anthropocene. It's not a doom and gloom framework. It's a guidance for science-based targets for us to be able to be successful, to be guardians, to be planetary stewards, to be everything that the Maori culture so strongly has been teaching us for millennia already. Now we have an operational framework to start implementing it. I see business uh, taking it up. I see the World Economic Forum taking it up. If you read the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, the first roadmap ever for humanity to deliver prosperous aspirational goals within planetary boundaries, we have now finally recognized that it's time for a transformation. However, there is reason to close, not only to be nervous, not only to be hopeful, but also to be angry. Because we're not moving. We're, we're the first generation to sit on this mountain of evidence of risk, and on this mountain of evidence of opportunity, but still we're not going to scale. How can we do that in one generation? That's the big magic. That's the big challenge for us. So of course, it's quite uncomfortable for an academic as me and, and many, many, many colleagues with me, to step out of our comfort zone. But we feel we have to act on the evidence we have. That's why holding hands, as we're doing in a dialogue like this, is so important. We have never been doing it before in so prominent ways, working with business, with policy, with civil society, with religious leaders. I just came back from a meeting with Kim Pullman, the wife of Paul Pullman, who's launched something she called the Golden Rule, the Golden Rule, which is the red thread across all religions of the world, that we should now treat our dear co-citizens and the planet as we wish to be treated ourselves. You know the Golden Rule across all religions. We need the mind shift. We need a paradigm shift to be able to really 
unleash a future where we can not only survive, but have prosperity and social inclusion on our wonderful planet. Thank you so much for and your, your patience with my voice. Thank you.